गुड इवनिंग आई थिंक इट्स इट्स रियली डिफिकल्ट टू बी ऑन ए सैटरडे इवनिंग एंड डूइंग दिस मॉडरेशन एंड एंड आई डोंट नो व्हाट आई एम स्टैंडिंग अगेंस्ट और फॉर इन टर्म्स ऑफ टाइम बट आई थिंक वील फिनिश डेफिनेटली बाय सिक्स पी एम दैट्स अ प्रॉमिस फ्रॉम माई साइड विद दैट आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम यू टू द नेक्स्ट पैनल डिस्कशन women and youth entrepreneurship for improved food and nutrition outcomes in south asia i think when i was looking at this title i got little uh, perplexed because of so many things in it and i thought the panel will do justice to it and i tried to broke it up into three parts one was women and youth then i looked at entrepreneurship and then i thought about improved food and nutrition outcomes so i think if you break it up into three parts then i think we can be able to do justice to this panel which is uh, having experience from different uh, you know experience from different uh, segments of what we are going to discuss today so uh, i'll not speak much uh, uh, we have i don't want to uh, go into introducing each one of them they are very eminent panelists you can go through the scanner and have a look at the bios but you have the names right here so i would go right direct into the discussions and i'll go to uh, miss anna roy who is the principal uh, uh, economic advisor niti ayog india and i would straight away jump into the entrepreneurship uh, aspects of what you are doing in niti ayog specifically focusing on your work on women platform entrepreneurship platform and the data analytics uh, system that you have set up if you can throw some perspective on that and then link it to various uh, issues and policies around entrepreneurship in india over to you anna uh, thank you samit okay uh, good afternoon everybody so i am here i was myself very confused why i have been invited i am here uh, because i am the mission director of women entrepreneurship platform which is a aggregator platform I joined Niti Aayog in 2016, and uh, the first charge was uh, data analytics uh, vertical. Uh, so, uh, what I have seen in Niti Aayog is multiplicity of uh, organizations, entities, who all work in silos, who do not talk to each other, uh, and a lot of information asymmetry. so uh, the first uh, charge which i took over was data and we set up the national data analytic portal because everybody would say there is no data available we realize that there is so much of publicly available data in india but because of lack of dissemination because of lack of access these were not easily uh, you know accessible uh, to people then there were many other things data was in silos there was loss of data through dashboards and you know uh, they were not machine readable so please visit national data analytic portal that was the first initiative i took over in niti and we launched it in uh, 21 it is a single stop shop for all publicly available data in india the data is uh, standardized Uh, with the lgd our uh, department of ministry of uh, panchayati raj brings out this uh, thing called local government directory so each village each unit locationally they have a common identifier so when you need to uh, when you standardize data you need to have some common identifiers we use that and data has become interoperable so if you pick up a district you can compare the education with the health with census uh, all the data which is available we take only publicly available data because we don't want to get into you know putting guardrails where you can access or not so everything on ndap is accessed now we have put registration necessary because we wanted to study the user profile so it is a public good uh you can access uh, the platform you can um, you know play around and it is very very user centric it, it has uh, around 7 to 8 filters where you can go national state district village level now what we don't do is get into the quality of data because that is the, that depends on the source the second thing we don't do which we can't own up if the data is not available that we cannot be responsible for 
However, this is all standardized. This is all machine readable. We have some analytics and now we are working on NDAP 2.0 where we will be doing a lot of more analytics. Now, this platform is essentially for uh, the uh, uh, policy makers. We have other countries represented. So please reach out, look at this platform. And this is a public good. We would like to replicate that. The second thing which we did was the women entrepreneurship platform. That also was launched in 2018, post the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, which was held in India, where globally many people came. There also we realized the information asymmetry. So there were so many pub, uh, government uh, initiatives, but uh, women were not aware of it. So we have set it up. I don't have much time. I won't go into detail. I will just leave it by saying we, uh, we set up a knowledge portal as an aggregator portal which gives you uh, information about all the government schemes, whether it is central government, state government. Today we have mapped 800 schemes. When we started, nobody was even aware that these kind of schemes are available. There is a smart matchmaker, so based on your profile, you can find out which scheme is aligned to your needs. Sec uh, secondly, what we have done is uh, a lot of, we do a lot of research. Uh, and based on that research, we have uh, found out six ecosystem needs, uh, which each uh, uh, woman, whether an aspirational entrepreneur or existing entrepreneur, needs, uh, needs for her entrepreneurial journey. So instead of tackling just finance or skilling or any one thing, we covered the entire six ecosystem needs for all the women whom we try to touch. The lastly, we have last year formulated so that we work in a cohesive manner the award to reward program, which is essentially a plug and play program where dif different constitutes can come and they can pick up a, a piece which they already are doing. So essentially award to reward ensures that we meet our vision. Our vision is to collaborate, consolidate, uh, converge and catalyze. And in one particular program, we have a cohort. Uh, for that cohort, the cohort is selected through competition. They are given capacity building intensive exercise for a week. Then we test them how much they learn. Then we select some people and we uh, give them some reward, whether it is seed money or anything else. Following which, there is a huge outreach because setting role models is very important. So this is the award to reward. Just by way of example, make my trip. Uh, uh, sponsored one of the award to reward where we got 30 homestay owners from the northeast. We brought them to Delhi for one week, paid everything by Make My Trip. Uh, the training was uh, uh, sponsored both by Web plus the ITC hotels who did a one week of uh, uh, intensive uh, training. And now we are into the second phase of uh, uh, testing what they learned and then they will be rewarded. Similarly, for Green Tech, we did uh, one such cohort uh, where nutrition played a big role because how do you, like uh, previous panel spoke about, it is not just research, it, it is not just supply chain, how do you reach the last mile? So many entrepreneurial women entrepreneurs are working with the grassroots, how to make their li uh, make uh, people's livelihood more robust, how to overcome the nutrition challenge. Many of them were there. So uh, it is all about specific cohorts. So this is also a public good. And in the spirit of G20, uh, both uh, the NDAP and WEP, dot, uh, you know, we would like to offer to the other Asian countries who are in the audience uh, and take it forward. And also for others, don, uh, you know, uh, from India, uh, it's a call for action to come and work with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Anna, for the keeping to the time. I think uh, the way you have addressed with the platform in terms of bringing various information asymmetry into uh, one place and then how people are using it and actually delivering last mile services uh, on, on uh, you said, uh, uh, homestay and also nutrition. That's, that's, that's really good. Now I would like to go to uh, uh, Dr. Chandra Prasad Risel, Project Director, RAD Nepal. Um, I would keep it very open for you, uh, Dr. Rissell, if you can focus on your project and what specific interventions are you, you are doing f uh, focusing on women and youth, entrepreneurship, food and nutrition. Thank you, Samit. Uh, 
I am speaking a little bit different from, uh, from different angle. That food and nutrition security uh, outcomes cannot be achieved unless and until we make agricultural production a profitable business. Because in, in our country, in Nepal, I'll say one background that 30% of agricultural land has been abandoned, not cultivated. This is because agricultural production, agriculture business is not being so lucrative to the farmer. So this is the background. So first of all, when we talk about the food and nutrition uh, security outcomes uh, in the region, then we have to focus on making agriculture business a profitable business. In Nepal, compared to the neighboring countries, the input, input is, agricultural input is a little bit higher than, than the uh, outside uh, neighboring countries. That's why when we produce in our country, because of land fragmentation issue, because of geographical difference, uh, difficulties, less mechanization facilities, our producers are expensive than the neighbor countries. That's why we are, you know, this is the main challenge in our country. To, to cope this challenge, we have uh, one new initiative in the country through REED project. This is a rural enterprise and economic development project uh, supported by World Bank that focus on productive partnership between producer and buyer. So this kind of productive alliance between producer and buyers that will make a kind of buyback agreement off-tech agreement before production process begins. We try to make such kind of productive alliance from the beginning that what kind of produce they should start. They should start the produce that is demanded in the market. That is most of the buyers want to buy. So we have to focus on producing such kind of quality of agricultural produce so that buyers are interested to buy it. And the produce will not suffer that they, they do not get market after production. This is really a big problem in Nepal. You can see in the news that more, most of the farmers, they grow, they, they do a lot of uh, work to produce food, but they are not getting uh, as uh, their input is. So they are, they are having protest, they are having, they, they show anger against the government. They, even they throw their produce in the, in the, in the road as a protest. T to s stop this, we are working uh, to make a productive alliance and uh, to make buyback agreement uh, in the, from the beginning. So we make uh, some kind of business plan. Without plan, we cannot success in any kind of uh, business. So in agriculture, especially in the agriculture, we are doing agriculture without any planning. So we produce as we can produce, and we go to the market without any market intelligence. So this is the problem. And we, we are focusing on uh, women and youth entrepreneurs to take part in the Productive Alliance. And we have, uh, till now, we have uh, prepared 302 Productive Alliances uh, in the country to make uh, their produce a start as per the market demand. As the buyers uh, want to buy, uh, they have to meet the quality of the, uh, quality buyers, they, they, they require certain quality of the produce and they, they have to meet the quantity, if possible, 
and they have to meet the delivery schedule of the buyer's uh, need. So this is the initiative we are doing from the read to uh, make uh, agricultural enterprises uh, in the country to success. So if I will get another round of uh, uh, chance, then I will mm. I'll be focusing on what are the achievements from our project. Maybe we are run, uh, running out of time. So I will I'll stop. Uh, I'll definitely this. make sure you get another round, definitely. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Okay, so I think I think very interesting when you started with your statement of uh, making agriculture uh, profitable. With that focus, you are trying to focus on productive alliance and, uh, as you call, productive partnership, and you have established around 300 to which is which is really good to know what exactly went into it. And your next question will be how nutrition sensitive they are and how are you working on nutrition. I'm giving you the question now so you can think about it for your next round. Okay, okay. Now now going to. Uh, going to Dr. Tayan, uh, FNS policy expert from Bhutan, uh, I see that you, you come with a variety of experience around various aspects of uh, your work. So you can pick up anything you want from your experience and share with us. How do you see this topic in, 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 in South Asia evolving over the next two, three years? And how do you think we, we in this region can uh, can really work towards a common framework to focus on some of these outcomes. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, let me take an advantage of uh, my being with uh, SARC Agriculture Center from 2013 to 18. I was there for five years, uh, meaning that I've had an opportunity to get a regional feeling of South Asia, uh, particularly from the uh, natural resource management context, Therefore, uh, I had an opportunity to interact with all the government's uh, officials and the ministries. Therefore, uh, I will I'll provide my impression uh, on, on this particular uh, topic. Again, uh, to be very contextual, uh, today afternoon, the Secretary of Mofi's remark, you know, how she was so excited to say uh, and proud that she was a woman and, you know, uh, making an impact on how she, the, 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 the lady farmers or the smallholder farmers could make, uh, generate income out of the small savings and she really showed that she was very proud to be a female herself. So I think uh, that is the role of uh, um, women in South Asia. They have a, a, a very strong power in, in, in building family, holding family, uh, generating resources, and more so in countries like, at least my country in Bhutan, you know, our inheritance uh, policy is, uh, shouldn't say uh, gender bias, but it is more to the woman. They, they hold the power to the inheritance property, like uh, most of the time that happens in Northeast India. So therefore, I think women have a big role in, in the whole family structure, therefore the economic structure, I think therefore the food security and the nutrition security. Uh, when I saw this topic, you know, uh, as someone who has studied regional economics and worked with South Asia, I was thinking uh, whoever put this topic probably would have put women in this because from the supply side, youth, you put it because from the demand side. So uh, this really, you know, if you look at from the economics point of view, you could really create and formal out of it. You know how women generate food, and they are designing a supply system, and there are youth group who are really demanding food, which is you know completely different. And uh, very interestingly, the other topic that was really uh, mentioned in the earlier panel was the ultra food. The I think the, the scientists here, the professor from ICR, talked about 24% demand has increased on ultra food in India. And you'll be very surprised in small countries like ours in Nepal and Bhutan, for example. Even there, uh, the impact of ultra food is very high. You'll be surprised. Uh, the way the market is structured now, uh, even in small communities, you'll be very surprised to see a stall which is on a on a... You know, uh, kind, as if in a city, you know, the stores are organized like that, and uh, the foods, bulk of the foods are all ultra foods. You don't see the vegetable that's produced in the locality. Therefore, you are kind of uh, 
uh, forcing the consumer to pick those kind of foods which looks very attractive. So uh, that was the thought I had actually. So if we want to make a policy, probably, uh, uh, again it was said by the earlier panel, is to make a crop neutral policies. You know? so, the tendency in South Asia, particularly some of the countries that we are dealing with, every policy, if you look at, these are all crop, uh, crop based. And uh, the price support system of India, you, if you look at the policy, it says 22 crops. If you look at the implementation, it is only two crops, the rice and the wheat, which is supported by the price support. Uh, and the same thing is replicated in many countries. Uh, the policy talks a larger overview of the, all the crops, I gave you a number for the India. Uh, for Bhutan, uh, we are still you know, uh, saying not to have a policy like that. Uh, I'm sure Nepal is doing similarly. In Bangladesh, uh, they do the similar thing that, I think they are really holding on not to have a policy like that because we have had a very good experience from, from India, overstocking of the rice, overstocking of the weeds. Therefore, you spoil, uh, there the are a lot of spoilages of the stock the, uh, in, in the warehouses. So, uh, from the stocking point of view, that's the idea. The other is uh, not to have a crop-based uh, policy also will have an advantage to focus on nutrition waste then. Therefore, uh, most of the countries in the region was very appreciative and we felt very proud you know, when Government of India announced this millet year last year and did a big program and all the shows that we see here in the exhibitions, uh, most of the products are millet-based. And countries, other countries around in South Asia has neglected this NUCs or, uh, or the neglected and underutilized crops, particularly the, the millet groups. I think with this, I'll stop here. Yeah, okay, thanks. thank you so much. I think you again reinforced the uh, crop neutral policy and, and how millet has been one of the game changers in India moving towards uh, a kind of healthy food in a way. So let me go to Sri Lanka now. And, and ask uh, uh, Mr. Raj, uh, Ms. Raj Singham, Executive Director, Vilutu Sri Lanka, to give a perspective on this topic to start with. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I'm representing Viridu, which is a civil society organization. And we are a rights-based, um, grassroots-focused organization. So I think from that perspective, our experience has been that, you know, the process of involving women and youth has been organic or natural. Um, where there is crisis or need, um, communities, and especially women, have responded. And those responses have led to you know, certain impacts, change, shifts uh, within the communities. And that has resulted into a movement then, you know, where there are opportunities open up, which automatically lead to entrepreneurship. So this has been our experience, and even for Vilidu, um, you know, our um, journey with food and nutrition actually started in a very simple meeting with women heads of households. And uh, our founder, Shanti Sachidanandam, was um, heading that meeting, and she found an older lady hadn't turned up for the meeting. And when she inquired, she found out that that lady had passed away. Um, the lady's death was not recorded as uh, death by starvation, but the community remembered her as a loving and doting grandmother who gave her food to her grandchildren because of poverty. And that is what, you know, that single story prompted Vilidu to then jump in into food and nutrition. And likewise, the women understood that this was an you know, immense critical need for them to also come in and join in and contribute. So, so I think you, you cannot, I think, alienate women. But um, in addition to what uh, uh, my colleague in the panel has mentioned, I think youth also play a very critical role in um, you know, uh, production and in the entire process. For us in Sri Lanka, particularly, you would have heard, we are right now in an economic crisis. And usually, um, for us, there has been war. Now we have the economic crisis. Previously, we had COVID. And you know, we've had uh, misinformed uh, policy interventions. And one such policy intervention, which uh, most of you may have heard of, 
was the ban of um, fertilizer imports that took place in 2021. But I just want to say that um, even though through the state um, the policy was not rolled out in an informed way and it was very abrupt, you know, we were highly, like our food um, systems were highly reliant on fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, and an overnight ban completely shifted. So it was not to say that organic farming doesn't work, but it was to say that these kind of change shifts have to be thought out, thought out through, and also it's not just physically changing a manure, but rather your practice systems. And what we saw was a youth movement that came in because there was a lot of misinformation regarding organic farming. And the youth came up and said, you know what, we're going to capture this data. We want to know, you know, what is the practice? You know, it could have been traditional practices, you know, lost through cultural shifts, but you know, like the way the women with the food, um, trying to see, okay, what are the food solutions? The youth also, you know, went in this process of rediscovery. And I think that's a key, um, key word for us, especially for Sri Lanka, and I think very applicable for the region. We're in the process of rediscovery. Thank you. I think uh, you touched upon various aspects of your work and how you have moved into uh, the food uh, uh, aspect of because of the policy on 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 uh, ban on fertilizer and what happened because of that and and the how, how the youth is getting involved so uh, let me move to miss madhmavati now who is a social entrepreneur in india working part, mostly in andhra pradesh i believe or telangana telangana, telangana pradesh both so i think you you could give us a very fast and perspective of how you are seeing this when you're working on ground on uh, and managing your enterprise oh yeah sure um First of all, I think most of the experts have taken us to a lot of revolutions. But I take you back even before when Vedas have actually evolved. Vedas tell that food is life force. And uh, it also says that our body is nothing but the five elements in nature, which is Panchabhutas. I think earth, air, water, air, and I mean earth, water, uh, space, air, everything is within us. And once you see this in aligned with the nature, when you are abusing nature, you're abusing yourself. This is something we re really need to realize. And, uh, and also, if you see the way we have been doing, food has been our identity. When you do community gatherings, it is food that connects you. And it is giving you a social identity, it is giving you a regional identity, it is giving you an ethnic identity. And when it is such an important thing in your life, you can never abuse it. And that is the most important thing. When I talk about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship knows no gender, it knows no age. But entrepreneurship is about bringing in social values. It is just not about economic value but it is also about the social values that you bring in. So uh, I will give you a very small example of how it is done. I work in a village. I closely work with farmers because I am also an entrepreneur in millet uh, manufacturing. When I work with farmers, I realize that these farmers really don't understand what research has been done in research institutes. What these farmers understand is the stories behind what they are really doing and at the end of the day, are they able to sell their grains? They really don't have that kind of infrastructure in villages. Today we talk about these people put their agricultural produce on road to understand who is going to be their buyer. And by the end of the day, if they're able to sell it, that is when they realize the value and they're happy. When the young people in their own family see these sad stories, they never get inspired by agriculture. This is a sorry state. I think what needs to change is bringing in strong local food systems. This is very important because I'll give you a small example of how this can be done. Suppose there are schools. 
you instill that you inculcate certain practices in schools which which the students understand the importance in food and nutrition if you see today some of the schools have started cultivating uh, cultivating certain vegetables in their own school premises to show this this is where the students would understand that yes this is where the food comes from and i need to respect it this is the respect it needs to gain the second thing is youth youth are moving out of villages actually the lands where the agriculture is actually happening is not in cities but in villages but you don't have youth who really think of real time problems real time solutions have to evolve from the institutes locally from the villages this is when i think the the, uh, the real uh, the real youth real, real understanding of the problems would exist and the real technologies would evolve and this is what is required today if you look at women women have a beautiful child bearing capacity if you look at why women's nutrition is so important it is because she is really bringing in the generations to really exist and also the generations to come because she has the producing capacity and also she is nourishing the children with uh, with good food and she knows what has to be given to the children so women nourishment is the most important aspect which needs to be understood so women also as they nourish they also understand the value of nourishment and this is where we need to involve women into entrepreneurship and if you look at it the entire ecosystem in the village has to be brought into a stronger focus it is just not governments which bring in policy governments have lot of policy and i think thankfully india has lot of brains working on making policies but we as people are more responsible in executing it i think that is the most important thing which has to happen the research can happen the governments can bring in policy but who is executing it executing at the ground level is the most important thing today and we as entrepreneurs i think are the people who can take it ahead the villages need torch bearers villages need people who can really instill confidence in them i think this is what is all entrepreneurship is about and if we can strengthen each village in its own sense i think the economy of the country would grow and the villages will become stronger and agriculture would grow the practices would be really aligned and the technologies will be aligned to the agriculture that is happening in these places i think this is my take on entrepreneurship in agriculture thank you thank you so much i think uh, um i think annapurna as your name suggests you made a lot of <laughs> lot of wonderful points there i think you enthused the saturday evening crowd here with uh, with your take on from starting from how uh, food is identity and how it comes from the vedas to social value everything on earth that we need to do to to do it right i think uh, uh, and also in the end when you spoke about how how the execution of policy lies with the people rather than people who are making the policies i think it's a very important point i think what i'll do is instead of going to the second round because uh, it's good to take a round of questions i think to to get some questions from audience so and then then maybe if time permits we'll go where to go to a second round because otherwise uh, it's, it's becoming a monologue since uh, two hours uh, any anyone uh, any any questions from the from the audience here if you still may i call out names because i know some of names here <laughs> anyone any any questions from any any table no yes can we have a microphone there please i think raj would definitely have a question i think or a comment i'll come to you raj next <laughs> uh no just to break the silence uh in fact is it audible yeah. yeah in fact i wanted to uh, ask this question to the previous policy panels uh, but thankfully a uh, colleague from sri, sri lanka brought brought up the matter uh, there is so much romanticism about organic farming but to feed in 
mass scale, we need the uh, mass production. So uh, my question, I mean, I, I don't know whether this is the right panel. Earlier it was the right panel. Because ask it was ask a question is always a good question. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, where does organic farming feature uh, when we're talking about ensuring food in a mass scale to a growing population? Thank you. Okay. We'll take that question. Any, anything else? Any question? Yeah, there's a hand over there. We'll Good afternoon all. Yeah. Uh, I am from Samposhyam Foundation and we are working uh, with coastal farmers from coastal saline zone uh, of West Bengal. So the, actually the women, uh, women there are idle. They, they asked me this question. Give us some entrepreneurship opportunity so that we can earn some money. So I was looking for some ideas and uh, some of the uh, esteemed panelists uh, she has highlighted some of the points. And this zone is very critical. In West Bengal, uh, what I am talking about is the Sundarvan zone. So we can't grow the crops throughout the region. There is, uh, throughout the season, there will be some flooding <coughs> and other environmental issues. So I would request some of the panelists to highlight what could be uh, an ideal solution for these women uh, who have uh, nothing. Means the husband goes for fishing and the women are uh, at the home and they asked that if uh, they thought that we are from the government and they had some hope that can you give us some uh, something that we can earn our livelihood on uh, so understood yeah, understood thank you yeah anyone else yes we'll take three and then we'll come back the gentleman in the maroon uh, suit here Hello everyone, uh, myself Devesh Goyal and I'm working as an executive at the Sector Skill Council for the Food Processing Sector of ICSI. So it's a government body under the Ministry of Skill Development. So it, uh, it's a great panel, uh, very much informative. Uh, my question would be to Ms. Dr. Tayan and Dr. Chandra. Like I'm working on currently on field in different states like West Bengal, Jharkhand and Uttar Pradesh and I'm seeing that th what the real impact on ground is and what are the gaps that we need to bridge up. So I would like to know their perspective because they are doing the skilling activities in the Nepal and Bhutan. So I would really uh, want to learn from their insider what kind of challenges do they face at the ground level at the, in these countries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we have three questions very directed. One on the organic farming and the mass production, uh, how far it can take us. Second is on the alternate uh, women and the third is on the on the challenges you are facing on ground in Nepal and Bhutan. So we'll go first through the organic farming thing. Yeah, yeah. just to um, share Sri Lanka's experience with the organic farming. So uh, 2021, so from 1950s, 60s onwards, um, the food production system is completely reliant on fertilizers. The policies that existed at that time um, were mostly on subsidies on fertilizers. So that was the way in which it was implemented. So the farmers, I mean, it's an entire generation, 1960s to now. So an entire generation that only knows fertilizer-based farming. So the, the, I think the problem that we saw was that as soon as in 2021 the ban came, um, there was a huge outcry from the farmer community that the yield was going to drop. And in two months, the government then made a small adjustment and said, okay, maybe private sector can import something. You know, we'll do some kind of concession even though we're in economic crisis. <coughs> but we did see a 40% decline in our production and there was, you know, a red alert where we were going, we were, we were told that there, may, there will be days, whether you are in the urban or in the rural, you will starve at some point. So that kind of warning was given to every citizen. But even though this was our experience, 40% drop, what we saw through community efforts, so this was not captured by the state, communities rose up and said, we want to explore what is organic farming. So we had women groups, try out. So that's what I said. It's not just taking a manure out and putting something else. It's an entire practice. So they went in. So right now, Viridhi is also exploring. 
And here, this is where we want to also say collaboration, of course, regional collaboration, but internally also everyone matter. So the collaboration internally is local communities who've been traditionally farming for generations. We have indigenous communities that have extremely different information and knowledge about the environment and the, the respect or the attitude for the environment that we need to learn from. And then you have the academia that has continued to study on the different varieties and the different methods. It's really bringing everyone together. So that's what Burude is also advocating in Sri Lanka. And we usually do model programs and then we put it out into the policy discourse. So that's a call that we're doing now. And I think without that, and the way in the youth movement capturing that data to say this can work. So in the model programs that we've run, we've actually been surprised because we thought, you know, <laughs> with the hopeful feeling that we have, we thought, okay, we will make our target. But in a lot of the model programs, they made over the target. The yield was more. Uh, they thought their um, you know, uh, crops would be attacked by pests. That, would, that didn't happen. So there is really a lot of knowledge. So as I said, time, cultural shift, m you know, misguided policies could have you know, made this kind of knowledge or source lost. But in the process of the rediscovery, carefully having inclusion as a main criteria, you can really achieve it. So that's on the first question. Just to touch on the second question, um, from Willis's experience, our women, when I said they dived into the food solution process, um, they came and they said, okay, we know something about nutrition, but you know, we don't want to do it in silo. Bring us a nutritionist, bring us you know, those experts. We want to talk with them, you know, you know one to one, you know, across the table as equals. And that's what they started with. They worked with nutritionists, Taking our traditional recipes, so for us, um, you know, we have uh, the dosa, the pittu, the, you know, the different uh, kind of cuisine that we have, and then they incorporated the knowledge and information they had and what the experts gave in, and they redesigned what we termed as the one dish meal, uh, which is a, you know, complete nutrient-packed meal that you can have. And for a lot of the families that became so essential, because most of the time they only just had one meal. So this kind of process first started as a solution building mechanism, but then turned into entrepreneurship where they started making it as part of their business. And you know, within that, um, the women uh, had agri products and also um, fish, big dry fish and other things were added into that one dish meal. So that is also something um, that the women can explore. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking that question. Yeah, Anupana, you want to address? Uh, yeah, I would want to answer your question in my experience as a member of an association called Association of Lady Entrepreneurs of India and also an entrepreneur. Uh, this is way back in, I'll just quote an example of how we did it and I think it could be replicated in any place. Uh, this is in way back in 2013, where Ministry of, this is not to food, but this can be replicated in food. The Ministry of Textiles has given a training program to our association. They wanted us to train about 35,000 women across. And um, uh, our president was very particular that I take this up in my village. So this is when I have actually, uh, I was really not too comfortable, but then I took up this as a challenge. The first and foremost thing I found is the women who are in those kind of, uh, I mean, who are in that kind of state are the people who really require a kind of training and confidence. See, when I started off the training program in village, people, uh, the women were not even ready to come to the training center to take the training program saying that we have seen many like this. You just uh, do the training and you leave us and there is nothing productive that we do in the entire training program. But to instill the confidence in them, the first day of my training, I promised them to take an order and pay them something. This is to see, uh, show them that there is an economic value to what you're getting trained. And once they have seen that, that is when I could train about 700 women in the village. 
700 women in the village and I also started a production center there to show them that this is what can be done. And when that has happened today, I have actually, I'm proud to say that we have actually produced about 10 entrepreneurs in the village who are now running on their own. So I think what is required is training initially, then bringing them to that, uh, there is a hand-holding support that is required for some time before they go on their own. I think these kind of things can really make a difference. Thank you. Uh, on the challenges that you're facing on ground in. Yeah, I will also respond to the gentleman's question that how we can uh, incorporate uh, women participation in, in the enterprise development process. That uh, I'll uh, have our experience in rural enterprise and economic development project in Nepal that we intervened uh, policy that we will give priority for the women entrepreneurs because we have learning that women are more loyal to implementing any type of enterprises than men. So we prioritize our selection procedure, implementation manual, we incorporated the policy to give priority for the women-led productive partnerships of projects. And also, if they are single, then we'll give more priority to them. Marginalized community will give more priority to them. That's why among 302 uh, productive partnerships of project, we, we are involving 8,673 entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs, and out of that, 4,196, that is equivalent to 48.4 percent of women involvement in our program. This is the way we are, we are involving more and more women entrepreneurs in the project activities uh, and income generating activities in our country. So this is one thing. Similarly, we, how we are focusing on uh, nutrition security. So out of 302 sub-project, we are implementing 140 sub-project in the dairy sector. as a nutrient uh, rich commodity. Similarly, the second position is meat related uh, commodities, uh, mostly got meat. In our country, got meat is more popular. Uh, meat uh, related uh, Sub project are 61 in number, that is second largest. Similarly, third largest is fresh vegetable production sub projects. And here, we cannot find any cereal centric mind in, in our project. That we are diversifying our products. Uh, similarly, we are focusing on high value commodities, for example, turmeric, ginger, mushroom production, similarly, honey production. This kind of activities, they are having more income generation than a, a traditional serial-centric production system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the third, because no one seemed to be responding to you, uh, on behalf of Nepal and me, uh, <laughs> Bhutan, uh, let me respond. I think uh, this is an unofficial announcement, but. Uh, ADB is going to release a book uh, on smallholder farmers of South Asia. I don't know when they will release, but they will be releasing. So, uh, although I'm not supposed to di disclose this, but <laughs> because you have asked it, uh, uh, just one, because it was, the question was raised, so I'm, we are responding. Uh, in South Asia, or even particularly Bhutan in Nepal, uh, because uh, we are uh, predominantly smallholder farmers. Bulk of, more than 50% of the farmers are smallholder, meaning they hold less than two hectares of land for productive agriculture, out of which only 50% can be cultivable, rest are, you cannot use the land for cultivation. So in this situation, there are two major challenges, the risk. In fact, all farmers across the world face this too, the market risk. You know? uh, uh, the most important is the market risk. 
The other is the production risk. And generally, whenever I discuss as an ag agronomist or an agriculture uh, background man, uh, in hills, in mountain farming, productivity is not an issue. Production is an issue. The reason is, uh, like it was explained, in, I think, in the morning, in the opening session, um, much of the crops are lost or wasted. And in terms of lost, that is production to processing, lost, uh, most of the loss happened due to climate change impacts and the wi wildlife damages. Uh, in Bhutan's case, we lose around 30% of the production is lost to these two factors. So whatever you produce, this much is lost. So the production risk is very, very high. Like even our minister in the opening remark, as Chief Guest was saying, you cannot, uh, uh, the risk of losing is very, very high. Yeah. So fine morning, you might see all your crops, you know, blown out by the storms and all that. So the complete damage. So that, that is what production risk is. Market risk is because of in mountains, you know, in mountain situations like ours, in Nepal and Bhutan, our markets, our food systems are very, uh, uh, we have to depend all on imports, mostly on imports. So therefore, the price volatility is very high. And generally what we produce, uh, the cost of production because of the labor issues, input issues, because all inpo inputs are imported, therefore the cost of production is very high. And so you cannot compete with an imported food. Therefore, uh, there is a trap in, in marketing the producers. Uh, the other uh, issue which is uh, between these two is the processing technologies, which are very rudimentary. In mountain smallholder farmer, they cannot bring in and put a big processing units which are, which are modern uh, kind of things. You know? So therefore, uh, I think they have basically trapped into this too. Therefore, the new study, the new book that will be released says that most of the Asian farmers are disposing their crops in distress. Most of the time, they don't make uh, a profit. Okay. So, uh, so this is where I'll stop. Okay, thank you for stopping right there because I think uh, we, we have a speaker who has come in late. I think we will give you the entire 10 minutes to take forward the discussion forward. Maybe I'm mean, 10 minutes is like a joke, but I think five, six minutes. If you can throw upon your uh, NIFTM's uh, focus areas on research, technology, and entrepreneurship, and what you're doing. Uh, it's on. So over to you, uh, Mr. Palimuthi. Good evening to each one of you here. First of all, I apologize for uh, coming a little bit late because the two ministers came at the same time with the gap, little bit gap. Our own minister, cabinet minister, and then uh, minister of state in my, to my pavilion. I was here. I ran back. I was just running here and there only. I was gasping, actually. I have not taken f f food from morning. <laughs> I do not know. I need nutrition probably. <laughs> More than women and youth <laughs> for improved food and nutrition. Uh, you, yeah, the, the model, I, I just uh, lost my papers. Uh, the, all the panelists, uh, fellow panelists, uh, good evening to uh, you as well. I am coming from an institute which is called National Institute of Food Technology, Entrepreneurship and Management. The title is very apt, apt here. Women and youth entrepreneurship. Men are oh, no, no, segregated out here. In fact, in, in my long journey in my professional life, 30 years, most of the time I was doing entrepreneurship work in the rural areas. I have established 16 agro processing centers when the concept was just new from 96 onwards. We established, at that time, even in uh, many villages in Karnataka, there's Bangalore where you know very well, but I, uh, that state is Karnataka state. The, the, the people there, the millers, the ragi is a staple food. Even to make a flour, there was, there's no machine. They have to go to 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, maybe to the town. That we started from primary processing of those agro commodities. And we try to put a small, small machine where electricity is possible. And that too, you know, the electricity doesn't come in villages all the time, like in Western countries. You plug in, always it is there. 
Now you have to check whether the current is there or not always here. <laughs> that is the situation we established those units and uh, made many, many entre entrepreneurs. Now I just, uh, uh, because this is a women and youth entrepreneurship for improved food and nutrition outcomes, I let me uh, quote uh, from our father of the nation, uh, Mahatma Gandhiji. He told, even a man is educated, only he becomes educated. When a woman is educated, the entire family gets educated. This is his own statement. And I know, extend it further. When several women in those villages, rural areas get educated, the entire, entire area gets educated. You know, that is a key. Because women, you know, whenever you, you are all family people, I believe. And uh, you see, always women in the house always pester that we have to put our children to the very best of the best schools in the town or the city. Why? Because they are always, you know, behind this education compared to men. Sometimes, you know, when I was young, my four, you know, my grandfather and all, they had several children. Sometimes, though, they do not know uh, the name of the seventh children or eighth children. No, like that, that was the time. The things have changed, now become one child, two child. I have only one daughter like that. Now things have changed. And women education is foremost important. Why we emphasize here, when you say women education, not getting a degree alone. She gets you know, educated in nutrition. She gets educated in health and all kinds of things, you know, finance. You know, we have, I have many statistics. I know just my mind is not... Uh, very clarity is not good. I'm, I was in a five, six sessions. I do not know which session I'm speaking sometimes. <laughs> very, I, I'm very, you know, jokingly I speak. I'm a very good teacher also, best teacher awardee also in the university. <laughs> no, 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 you know, I have some statistics, really, really something are mind boggling. This, this country is very peculiar country, you know. We have 63 million MSMEs. 63 micro and small and medium enterprises. Maybe some of them are in food side and some of them are other side. <coughs> the interesting statistics here is in that only 20% of uh, the, those enterprises are women uh, centric. Only 20%. That means 80% is all taken over by men. That's why all the accounts are uh, no, held by women. Our prime minister is very smart man. He opened all accounts, you know, these uh, Dhanshri uh, Dan accounts only for in the name of women because the money is spent very well. No, we have a very interesting so, where sir, they are employed. As, as the moderator, can I make your, uh, make your speech a little bit more direct yes. and ask yes. you quick rapid questions yes, so that that's you better. can answer them one by one and it will give that's you the better. first that's person's better. Is it okay better. with you? Yes, that is better. So fine. tell us what does NIFTM does? Yes, that is a fantastic. Now, Niftam Tanjavur, many of you may know, this started uh, way back in 67 as a research organization for paddy uh, processing. Now we have become an institute of national importance, like in any, any other IIT or NIT, institute of national importance, which is in the name itself, there is entrepreneurship and management. We have uh, academic programs, uh, B-Tech, Food Technology, Masters in uh, three disciplines, for uh, uh, M-Tech food technology in food process technology, food process engineering, food safety and quality assurance, even PhD programs as well. Uh, we uh, now take the students through joint entrance examination, the prestigious examination in the country. Now more than that, that is academics is only one third of our work. One third of the work is goes for research. We do lot of development of machinery, small type Missionary for pr food processing. Many food products, uh, now we have about 180 uh, technologies already released for commercialized. And many companies have taken, you can visit our B30 hall. I think some of you have gone uh, day before yesterday uh, in uh, 14, uh, hall number 14, B30 pavilion. And we do develop many products. There, most of the products are taken by female entrepreneurs, self-help groups of women, or farmers uh, uh, organizations, and we give complete training. And we have a website, if, if you go to Niftam, Tanjavur website, it is a, no, we have a PMFE, there is a macro there. You go there, for 376 products, food products, we have uploaded 
all videos different categories all videos all powerpoints all dpas detailed project reports you can straight away put your name and the, uh, your mobile number you can your dpr is ready you can start gova processing you can straight away download it all you have to enter complete analysis bankable dpr is ready in our website so and it is available so in 13 it, languages so what are the kind of technologies you bring in basically focused on only on food processing or you get Most into only food because we are a food pro, food technology institute we are bound to do only that work mandated to do that work and we have a capacity building in the sense suppose we somebody wants to do and uh, now chocolate they want to make a chocolate plant we have an incubation center business incubation center we have about seven lines we give hands on training they will themselves will do all the processing and we they can be an incubator till they are very confident in uh, you know putting a capital investment they can be trained there very small amount of uh, fees so can you give two examples of uh, entrepreneurs that you have come across were working specifically on food and nutrition yes. in you. very uh, very good thing you know if you go to hall number 14 just opposite to our there is a man cookie man there is a brand that man is just eighth pass eighth standard pass he is exporting our uh, incubator and their training for last 15 years he is exporting his cookies to eight countries he is not even sslc pass and he, is put, he has put up a stall. There are many. We have transferred to many uh, technologies. That's like Nira. You know, coconut sap is a very nutritious uh, drink. Somebody was talking in the morning in the previous session. Nira, when you have a, you can drink, very extremely good drink. But it's a storability is just about three, four hours. It will become tardy, alcoholic drink, which is banned in many states in this country. And the Philippines and Sri Lanka, Maldives, here everywhere you have a coconut, even Thailand and Malaysia. And uh, we have developed a, a system, complete plant. We have put a miniature plant in Ministry of Food Processing Pavilion. That plant, you pour the, you know, you, you, that, uh, take the nira, it converts into a nira sugar powder, granules or crystals. The value addition is five to six times. And it is very good for Ayurvedic preparations and other things. A little bit lower GA as well. Okay. Fantastic. I think these examples are good to listen to you from. And we'll go to the pavilion some of yes, them and look yes, at yes. it. Yes, You are welcome. Last question I have for you before, yes. because we have to round up. I promise 6 o'clock we'll end. Is about how do you see the, the technology, the research work, the knowledge that you're generating through your institute traveling around the, the South Asian countries? Is there any outreach program? Is there people coming from other countries in this region to, to your institute and how does it, how, and if you have any ideas or any plans towards it? Sir, we, we do get uh, trainees from many African countries to our institute through Ministry of External Affairs. Currently, just a day before yesterday, we had two-day session with the RIS. RIS is uh, under Ministry of External Affairs uh, with the German uh, funded Sri Lanka as well as Maldives. They want to have a capacity building program in their country. And we are on an advanced stage of uh, doing it. We are going to establish these incubation centers in Maldives and Sri Lanka, and uh, for especially coconut and locally grown vegetables. First, they will get training here. We will establish actually women for women entrepreneurs. And uh, that they can run later on. Maybe it will take some time for them to accustom to those technologies. And uh, that is, we are in the process. And uh, the uh, GAIN, I think this is funded by, uh, I think, Gate Foundation. GAIN, this is again for uh, uh, fortification from oil and uh, milk and then this rice. Rice is now getting fortified in India. In five states, we have already implemented. We are uh, again a partner for okay. training for multinational, multinational. So I, I think there are there are seeds of collaboration, partnership ha ha happening across Africa, Asia, and, yes. and Sri Lanka, Maldives that you spoke about. So I'll stop stop our kind of uh, discussions now. So what I'll like to do last round is to see if any of you have questions for each other. Any questions as panelists, you have been listening to each other. Do you think you have anything to say as we go forward to close this? Any of you wants to go? Yeah, one, one, one and a half minutes, not more than that. Yeah, just in a brief, that I'm very much interested about NIFTEM activities. Actually, we are also working in business incubation support for the young uh, youth and uh, women uh, lead entrepreneurs. So because of lack of uh, such kind of uh, service providing agency in, in the country, 
we want uh, some collaboration with NIFTEM. Uh, yeah, and I have already talked uh, this thing with our director. Uh, that uh, fantastic. So there is a partnership. Is, uh, such kind part of partnership we want to. So uh, there's a partnership have. blooming which can go after the discussion, and you can discuss with yes. the director, you know, if, and then take it yeah. forward. Any anything else? Anybody else? Any question? With open arm, I'm immediately telling yes. Thank sure, sure, Thank sure. You can sir, sign minute, MOU sir. tomorrow itself. One minute. I'm ready there in the pavilion, Murphy pavilion. One minute. Ministry uh, pavilion. Yeah. We can sign MOU. Okay. Now let's let's go to Anupuna. You you have a last comment. <laughs> I think the way to go would be a cluster approach, uh, where I think the government of India has already done a lot because where the crop is creating a cluster around the crop and involving all the stakeholders into it is a good approach. The second thing is strengthening sure. the infrastructure, strengthening the local food systems, and also creating entrepreneurship locally is one of the major things. And I also would like to just quote that in Alip, we did one cluster in jo with Jogini women in Adilabad, uh, in Na Narayan Pet, where there were 20 women who were brought together, bringing up a rice fortification unit. So I think uh, the women had very low seed capital put into the thing and the 20 women who are running a 50 crore business now. I think these are the uh, kind of uh, examples that we require more now. Thank you. Over to Maitri. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, while uh, we look into production and, and processes, you know, we shouldn't forget the market. And, uh, you know, um, Viridhi and Elip were connected um, through the network that we are part of called BEES, Business Enterprise Employment Support for Women in South Asia. And, um, you know, even without a form formal program running, just with the exchanges that we've had, there were so many key learnings which have now, you know, deeply influenced our, you know, country programming, um, even within the developmental sector informing. So, so I, I feel that, you know, um, investing in all parts is important. And uh, a key thing that Bees brought out for us is women for women. So women being the aggregators, women expanding the market space for women um, is something that um, strongly worked for us. And, I, and that's something that we would say invest on uh, for anyone here. Thank you. This is what happens when content comes from women, men exchange cards for business. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're still exchanging cards. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Roy, you have anything last point to make? No, what I, I announce is I'll work with my co-panelists and launch the next award to reward where uh, the mobilization of the participants will be done by Annapurna. And uh, we'll work with uh, NIF, NIFTM, NIFTM. NIFTM to provide the capacity building, which we do with others. So with both of you, uh, we'll, uh, we'll launch the next award to reward for women Fantastic. Uh, under the Niti Ayog's uh, Women Entrepreneurship Platform. And I really hope the purpose for coming here was to tell about WEP. And if we can take it, it's a public good. And as you all know, India is now, you know, promoting public uh, digital goods. So we would really like to take the WEP platform to other countries like in Sri Lanka. It's all about getting all the stakeholders at, in, at one place. You do your bit, somebody does somebody else's. And we allow women to move the next step. They could be at any level. We are not saying you have to be this level. They could be at any level but they, we enable them to move uh, to the next level. And uh, I look forward to working at least with this and then move on to the other constituencies. That would be a great thing. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I just want to remember my mother now because she used to always tell me that when you are in a meeting, ensure that at the end of the meeting there is some kind of transaction that happens. And I saw a lot of transactions happening. <laughs> And, and, and I'm sure this will be sustainable and this will be taken forward for long-term partnerships. The, although the objective of this session was not bad, but I think we are, we are going towards a conclusion which is much beyond this, this seating that we had here. 
I can see from you clear offers. I can see from Nepal clear offers coming for partnership. With that, thank you all, uh, 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 panelists, for your very informative session. And I learned a lot, but and I'll not take the liberty to do the conclusion. I don't know where it will go. So now, I, <clears throat> now I'll ask Brahm to please uh, hand over the token of appreciation to uh, the fellow panelists I have here. Thank you. Hello. Sorry, before you, you leave, there are some closing remarks. Sorry, sorry, we're just having closing remarks. We are having some closing remarks by our colleague Andrew Goodland. If I could just ask that you take your seats once again. Uh, it will be short, and then we would like to invite you for a group photo at the end. Thank you, Andrew, if I could call on you, please. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, good evening. Can I have uh, can I have everyone's attention very quickly? It it falls apart. I'm the least popular person in the room now, because I'm going to force you to listen again uh, to a few uh, closing remarks. So um, let me just uh, not everyone's paying attention, but that's fine. <laughs> let me keep it very brief. Cause I'm the one thing between you and and dinner. So I was asked to reflect on and have put in a few of my own takeaways from today's session. I'll keep it really brief, five things. First thing, it's complicated, it's messy, uh, we know this. Uh, whether you're looking at agri-food systems, which we know anyway are very complicated, we see the entry points for nutrition are throughout, from, from, from farm to fork. And of course, it's not just about agri-food systems, it's about education, it's about water sanitation, it's about health, it's about social protection. It's a difficult field. Um, which is why we need to all uh, 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 come together. Solutions have to be multi-sectoral. Number two, nothing can be achieved without the private sector and entrepreneurship. This is clear, and the last session brought it out very clearly. We have to find ways of incentivizing. We have to find ways of generating entrepreneurship around this area. There are solutions there. Go look at the stalls. Uh, we have a very vibrant entrepreneurial society within South Asia. It can deliver if it's given the opportunity to do that. Third thing, that said it requires public policy. The public policy existing in South Asia today is simply not conducive to getting strong nutritional outcomes. It needs a rethink. 
we need to repurpose, uh, we need to incentivize those uh, uh, activities which are going to help to get us to where we want to go. We may need to regulate to prevent sugary foods, etc., uh, ultra-processed food, but it's going to require public policy to play a lead role. Fourth, women and youth. We heard it strongly. Women make a lot of our household decisions around food and nutrition. Uh, we have to empower women. Women can help change minds at, at the local level. We've seen it. We see it in India with uh, the self-help group movement. We have to find a way to channel our messages through women, because women are the decision makers who, and they're change makers. Fifth and final is about partnerships. That's why we're here. Partnerships with the private sector, partnerships with civil society, partnership with policymakers. It's across sectors, it's across countries. And this is why Sapling has been created, and this is the aim of Sapling, is to make these linkages. And what we've seen here today, and I want to build off the energy we just got from that last session. Uh, there is a lot of interest in this. We need all of you to be champions to take this forward. This is just the beginning. This will now hopefully gain momentum. We continue these discussions uh, and we can uh, uh, grow through that. So finally, just a, a few words of thanks. Firstly, to uh, a MOFP, um, especially Secretary uh, Anita Praveen and her team, Joint Secretaries Praveen, uh, Ranjit Singh, uh, Mr. Dongra, uh, plus Invest India and uh, Afiki. Without you, we wouldn't have had this session at all. We really thank you for giving us this opportunity to host this session. So thank you. Uh, thanks for your organization as well. This has been a fantastic event. I'm blown away. Uh, uh, secondly, I'd like to thank uh, 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 Gates. Uh, Siddharth is still with us. Uh, Gates is the ones putting the financing behind Sapling. Without them, this doesn't happen. So thanks, Gates. <laughs> uh, thank you to all of the, uh, the speakers, all of the panelists. Uh, I think we had some really interesting observations. I learned a ton of new things I didn't know before. Uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for giving your time uh, to be with us uh, this afternoon and this evening. And finally, thank you to all of the participants in the room. I hope you're similarly inspired as I am. Uh, let's move forward with this. Uh, let's make these things happen. And now, I believe, I can close. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sure. Can, can people come for a group photo at the front, please?